today on Grace to You. There will be no end to the increase of his government. It is a kingdom that encompasses all the universe and all eternity. This is a massive responsibility on the shoulders of this child, this son. What in the world makes us so embarrassed about the gospel? For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Just to think a little bit about the Christmas uh, season as we live through it again this year, what comes to my mind is how enigmatic uh, Christmas is, how paradoxical it is, how contradictory Christmas is. I looked up the word paradox, um, uh, knowing that it comes from two Greek words, doxa, which essentially means a fact, a truth, an idea, para alongside. Paradox means two truths laid alongside each other which um, are both realities and yet are somewhat contradictory. One classic old English definition would be this, that paradox is something seemingly absurd and yet true. And there are some serious paradoxes around Christmas. It is... it has a split personality for sure. There is Santa Claus, a mythical, supernaturally empowered fat elf who slides down chimneys and whose entire verbal contribution to the world is ho, ho, ho. I'm not sure how he's managed to have such a lasting impact. And juxtaposed to him is none other than the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is supernatural, the God-man whose words are profound and deep and eternal and life-giving, and um, somehow this culture is caught somewhere between those two very different characters. Mass confusion seems to exist, furious rushing everywhere, traffic madness, crowds, impossible schedules while we all celebrate peace on earth. Find very little of it so that even Suicide rates are at an all-year high at Christmas season. Two thousand years ago, one star lit the sky over the spot where the Lord was born, and now so many houses have lights, and so many lights shine in so many places. We're almost drowning in lights around the Christmas season, and many stores are lit up, you know, places where you can go and um, buy what isn't needed and won't fit. (laughs) There's just a kind of Christmas chaos. The first Christmas was poor one, a manger, a stable. Christmas today is a display of wealth as millions of people spend billions of dollars to indulge in temporal things. First Christmas, wise men came to worship, and today fools worldwide ignore the one the wise men worshiped. Santa Claus gives you what you want because you deserve it. Jesus Christ gives you what you need even though you don't deserve it. Very different. Those are sample paradoxes, not the important ones that I want to address this morning, but I do want to show you the the paradoxical, enigmatic, apparently contradictory nature of Christianity that demonstrates to us its supernatural character and revelation. And to be able to see this, we need to go to the other side of Christmas, the before Christmas side, back in the Old Testament, and look at some of the prophecies concerning the Messiah. Now we know that the prophecies concerning the Messiah were very difficult to understand much more difficult for the prophets who prophesied them than even for us. And they were inspired by the Spirit of God to write 
what the Lord told them to write. Even at that, they could not understand what they were writing. And we hear Peter say this in 1 Peter 1, 10 and 11, "'As to this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful searches and inquiries, seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating as He predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. The prophecies were about two things, the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories of the Messiah. And those two juxtaposed throughout the prophecies of the Old Testament made it difficult for even the prophets who wrote the prophecies down to understand so that they made careful searches and inquiries into what person and what time they themselves were even writing about. The Old Testament presents the coming Messiah as a conqueror, and yet in other passages it presents Him as a defeated enemy. In some Old Testament prophecies He is seen as bringing joy to the world. In other Old Testament prophecies He is seen as a man of sorrows. Uh, Sometimes He is seen as the conqueror, sometimes as the one who is rejected. Sometimes He is seen in great triumph and strength, and sometimes in abject weakness. He is the one who will bring life, and yet in other prophecies He is the one who will die. Some speak of Him as King of glory, King of heaven and earth, eternal King, desire of all nations, and yet other prophets say there will be nothing about Him that men should desire Him. These kinds of enigmatic, paradoxical statements need an explanation because they appear on the surface to present someone who is caught in some level of absurdity because of these kind of contradictions. He is to be the lion of the tribe of Judah, and yet He is a lamb led to slaughter. He is to be the judge of all the world. He is to come and judge sinners, burning them with unquenchable fire, and yet He is to be unjustly judged by sinners and executed as a criminal. All of these conundrum-like truths are lying side by side in the Old Testament and cause the prophets to search to find out what time, what person could possibly fulfill all of these. This query stretched even into the New Testament. Open your Bible to Matthew 11 and let's go to chapter 11 verses 1 and following and come into the curious situation with regard to the last Old Testament prophet, the herald of Jesus Himself, John the Baptist. John the Baptist was really miraculously conceived. Zacharias and Elizabeth were barren into their very old age. The Lord allowed them to have this son who would be the last of the Old Testament prophets really after four hundred years of silence, and He would be the prophet who announced the arrival, not anticipating the coming as the other prophets, but announcing the arrival of the Messiah, which is exactly what John the Baptist did. As we find Him here in chapter 11, however, things have not gone the way He thought they would go. He is in prison. He is in a prison that's part of a Herodian palace about five miles east of the Dead Sea and fifteen miles south of the northern shore. This is a fortress called Machairus. It is a, a very desolate place. Apparently He has allowed visitors and folks have come and given Him some information about what the Messiah, Jesus, is doing. And John is highly confused. To understand his confusion, turn to Luke chapter 3 and listen to his message. And this is not a message that he developed on his own. This is a message that 
came to him from God Himself. Chapter 3 of Luke and verse 1, the fifteenth year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate is the governor of Judea, Herod is the tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip, tetrarch of the region of Iteria, Trachonitis, Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene. These are the sons of Herod the Great. In the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, listen to this, the Word of God came to John. So John spoke the Word of God prophetically about the Messiah. He is still an Old Testament prophet. The Messiah is here, but His real work has not yet culminated in His death and resurrection. So John is still prophesying about the Messiah as prophecies come to Him from the Lord Himself. He came into the district around the Jordan preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. He's preaching that because judgment is coming. And the Lord, the Word of the Lord comes to him and he is to speak the words of Isaiah the prophet, and here is what he is to say, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, that's him, make ready the way of the Lord, make His path straight. Every ravine will be filled, every mountain and hill will be brought low. The crooked will become straight and the rough roads smooth, and all flesh will see the salvation of God." He's preaching millennial glory, millennial kingdom. He's preaching the restored earth, paradise regained. He's preaching salvation. And along with that, He's preaching judgment. So He began in verse 7 saying to the crowds, who were going out to be baptized by Him, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore bear fruits in keeping with repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham for our father. For I say to you that from these stones God is able to raise up children to Abraham. Indeed the axe is already laid at the root of the trees. So every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire." Further down in that chapter, notice verse 16, John speaking again, "'As for me, I baptize you with water. One is coming who is mightier than I. I'm not fit to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire, the fire of judgment. His winnowing fork is in His hand to thoroughly clear His threshing floor and to gather the wheat into His barn, and He will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire." This is John's message. It is a message of repentance, crying out for forgiveness, a message of salvation, a message of the establishment of the kingdom, and the judgment of all sinners. John has seen none of that. There is no great work of salvation being done in Israel. The nation has rejected Him. There is no judgment on them as of yet. There is no fiery holocaust on their heads. And John doesn't understand what's going on. Back to Matthew 11, he sends his disciples to Jesus. And in verse 3, having heard of the works of Christ, and they're not works of judgment, and they don't even appear to be works of salvation or the establishment of the kingdom, He sent word by His disciples and said to Him, "'Are You the expected one, or shall we look for someone else? Something isn't right. He is confused. Notice the Lord's answer. Jesus answered and said to them, the disciples of John who had come to represent Him, "'Go and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them.'" That is the opposite of judgment. That is benevolence, that is mercy, that is kindness, that is blessing. That is 
healing like never in the history of the world. And our Lord, by the way, is quoting in those words from Isaiah 35 and Isaiah 61. So He is saying the prophets not only prophesied about judgment, fiery judgment, they prophesied as well about mercy and kindness and the relief of suffering. So the Messiah is to do both. And in verse 6 comes our Lord's direct message to John the Baptist, "'Blessed is he who does not take offense at Me. Trust Me. Trust Me. Don't draw any wrong conclusions. Don't be offended by what you think is the full picture. John is facing that same tension that the Old Testament prophets all faced. What is this going to be like when He comes? Who can do what He has been prophesied to do? And how can these contradictory, enigmatic components come together in one person in one time? It is a marvelous reality in Scripture that the diverse and seemingly contradictory prophecies regarding Messiah make it impossible for any other person than the true Messiah to fulfill them. They are too contradictory, too paradoxical, too enigmatic, and too complex, and too prolific. All of these Old Testament prophecies are locked treasures to which the key is the New Testament. What was difficult for the prophets to understand, what was well-nigh impossible for John the Baptist to understand, you and I understand perfectly because we have the New Testament. We have the full record, and the New Testament ends with the book of Revelation that stretches to the ultimate fulfillment of all the prophecies of the glories to follow His suffering. Mystery, paradox, enigma make it impossible to counterfeit. They had a hard time getting it. We get it. We see it. Listen to this. Matthew 13, our Lord said to His disciples, verse 17, "'Truly I say to you, many prophets and righteous men desired to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. That was what it was like even to be a righteous person and to be a prophet in the Old Testament. You didn't have a clear picture. You didn't have a clear sound. But back up to verse 16, our Lord says to His disciples, "'Blessed are your eyes because they see and your ears because they hear.'" These paradoxical things to them are crystal clear to us. Let me show you a a handful of them. First of all is the mystery of the incarnation. Go back to Isaiah 7, the mystery of the incarnation. The story of Christmas, the reality of Christmas is the birth of the Son of God and the Son of Man both man and God in one person. We see that. We understand it on this side because we have the full New Testament revelation of the nature of Christ. But listen to the words of Isaiah 7.14. Ahaz the king is the context and God wanted to give him a sign and he refused to receive a sign from God. But the Lord broadened that to a sign for the world, really. Verse 14, "'Therefore the Lord Himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call His name Emmanuel.'" A virgin will bear a son. That has never happened. That's impossible. But that was necessary because there had to be a human in the equation, but not two humans, a human and God, 
So the Holy Spirit conceives in Mary the child who is both son of Mary, son of God. How are they to understand the Old Testament prophets, a virgin being with child? Well, they understand a child, that's, that's normal process. You, you give birth to a child. And yet, this is not just a child, this is a son. And this is a son whose name is Emmanuel. The Lord Himself, by His own will, by His own power, will produce a supernatural sign identifying a king far greater than Ahaz, the great king. The sign is this, a virgin shall conceive. The word virgin in Hebrew is Alma. All Old Testament uses refer to a virgin. The word behold is here because it's a shocking statement in and of itself. There will be a child but also a son, a child speaking perhaps of His humanity and a son speaking of His deity. And He will be Emmanuel, which means God with us. And we know in Matthew chapter 1, this prophecy is quoted in verse 23 as fulfilled in Jesus. He is truly God, truly man. Let me say it again, truly God, truly man. This is the ultimate absurdity. This is the ultimate conundrum, enigma, that someone would be 100 percent of one thing and 100 percent of another indivisible. Go over to chapter 9 of Isaiah, and again Isaiah injects another of these prophecies. Verse 6, for a child will be born, again speaking of the child makes reference to natural birth. Everyone is born as a child, of course. But also that child will be a son given, not just a child born, but a son given. Given by whom? Given by God. So again, you have man and God. You have fully man, fully God in one being. Born and yet given, born to a woman and yet given from heaven as if He already existed because He did. And the government will rest on His shoulders. Shoulders are the symbol of carrying the weight and several times in the book of Isaiah, particularly chapter 22, verse 22, you see the use of shoulders to refer to ruling. You carry the weight of rule on your shoulders. You carry the weight of responsibility on your shoulders. This this child will have the government on his shoulders. Um, Some of you think you have a lot of responsibility with a family. There are others who have responsibility with, with a business or responsibility with a class of students or responsibility for patients in a hospital or whatever it might be, responsibility for soldiers in a battle, responsibility to lead cities or nations. This this ruler, this child, this fully God, fully man will have on his shoulders the responsibility to rule a kingdom that has no limits and has no end. Go down to verse 7, there will be no end to the increase of His government, no end, on the throne of David and over His kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. It is a kingdom that encompasses all the universe and all eternity. This is a massive responsibility on the shoulders of this child, this son. That statement, to the increase of His government, there is no end, means He rules over all, all. His rule will fulfill the promise to David. He will sit on the throne of David and over His kingdom to fulfill the Davidic covenant, 2 Samuel 7. He will establish His kingdom with justice and righteousness, which means there's going to be some punishment. That's 
laid out in Psalm 89 magnificently. He will come and He will establish His kingdom with justice and righteousness. Psalm 2 says He will ro rule with a rod of iron, instant justice, instant righteousness, instant punishment. But it will be a kingdom of peace. It will be a government of peace. Peace will be established by justice and righteousness, and it will last forever, and the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. God's plans cannot be altered. So here is a prophecy about a child to be born who is also a son given, a child in the earthly sense, a son in the heavenly sense, who will have a kingdom with no limits in terms of space and no limits in terms of time. And to further identify His rule, He has given a name. His name is a composite of several things. Back to verse 6, His name will be called Wonderful Counselor. That doesn't mean He's really helpful when you have a problem. He is that, but that's not the point. As compared to Solomon, who was the wisest man who ever lived, this man is a wonder of a counselor. This is talking about the infinite nature of his wisdom. I am more than grateful to let you know that the Lord has graciously provided everything and far more for the ministry of grace to you through this year. It's, it's stunning the outreach the Lord has allowed us to have. Grace to you and uh, gracia a vosotros, the Spanish version, are heard more than 2,000 times a day worldwide. Nearly two million sermons are downloaded every month from the Grace to You website. More than one and a half million CDs, 60,000 booklets, and 50,000 books were given away free of charge in 2018. And I want to give you one more amazing statistic. We now reached 120 million sermons that have been downloaded from the Grace to You website. 120 million. Grace Reaches Out, which is our translation ministry, is also working to translate nearly 600 sermons into key languages French, Portuguese, Arabic. Mandarin Chinese, and that work is going on, and many of those uh, sermons already translated are available on the website for the people who speak those languages. And I want to remind you that support this ministry. The last couple of months of the year are crucial in terms of donations. We normally would receive about 25% of our annual income in the very end of the year. So keep us in your prayers, keep us in your mind. Thank you for the direct role that you are playing in making GTY ministry available around the world. It really is the Word of God unleashed one verse at a time. Thank you for partnering with us.